Number 20, letter A. The density of water at 0 degrees Celsius is very nearly 1,000 kilogram per cubic meter. It's actually 999.84 kilogram per cubic meter, whereas the density of ice at 0 degrees Celsius is 917 kilogram per cubic meter. Calculate the pressure necessary to keep ice from expanding when it freezes, neglecting the effects such as a large pressure would have on the freezing temperature. All right. So uh, let's pretend that we are starting with uh, this amount of water. Okay, we have 1,000 kilograms of water, and I'm using the you know the approximate value here for the density of water. Um, you can use the exact value; it doesn't matter to me. The so this block will be about you know 1,000 kilograms if it's one meter right by one meter by one meter. Okay. Now, when we take this mass of water and we freeze it, what happens to the volume? The volume expands, right? You know ice expands. So does the mass, though, change? Well, no, right? If you freeze 1,000 kilograms of water, you have 1,000 kilograms of ice, assuming there is no evaporation. So if I had to now create a new picture of what the ice block would look like relative to this water block, I would create a picture like this, right? Let's just copy it, okay? Let's paste it. Let's expand it now, because we know that it's gonna be a little bigger, all right? And I'm gonna change the color. So let's have it be blue. And it's still gonna be 1,000 kilograms, all right? So I'm just gonna erase that so the numbers don't get all confusing. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna superimpose it basically on this block of water, okay? So now what we have is that this block of ice now, right? Remember, the red it represents the block of water. It has expanded. And the mass of this ice is still going to be 1,000 kilograms, as we discussed. But we don't know the volume, right? It's going to expand to some length. It's going to be some new length, right? It's going to not be 1. It's going to be 1 plus something. And then it's going to be, you know, same thing over here and same thing over here. I'm assuming a perfect cube. Why am I doing that? just because I think it makes the math easiest. You don't have to assume a cube, you can assume any shape you like. All right, now, what do we know? Well, I know the density of ice. They told us, right? It's 917 kilogram per cubic meter. Uh, we also know the mass of this block of ice, right? It's 1,000 kilograms. And I wanna find the volume of that ice block, the new ice block that formed. How do I do it? Well, simple, right? Density is equal to mass over volume. If you want to solve for volume, you simply just cross multiply here, right? So it's the mass of the ice. Well, that is true. It's the mass of the ice, right? Divided then by the uh, density of the ice. Now, remember, though, the mass of the ice here is the same as the mass of the water. Okay, so you can, you know, you can, that's fine. You can substitute in the mass of water here, or also realize the way I set the problem up that I can also plug in the density of water up here, right? Couldn't I do that? Because the density of water is about a thousand, and I chose to represent this as a one by one by one block. So the mass of this block will be equal to the density of the water, all right? So I can now rework this slightly. If I wanted, you don't have to do it, but it's the density of the water divided by the density of ice. And if you wanted to find a real number here, you do so, right? It's 1,000, then over 917. So what do we get here? I'll plug it into the handy-dandy calculator, 1,000 over 917. And we get approximately 1.09, right? 1.09, I don't care about sig figs. So 1.09. So now uh, the units here are going to be cubic meter, okay? That's the new volume, I'll call it, right? This is basically the new volume of the block of ice. Why do I, why am I calling it the new volume? Because I'm considering the block of water is what we, the, that's the volume we started with, right? We started with a one by one by one. So the old volume of this H2O uh, was one, okay? One cubic meter. And now the new volume, because ice, because the water froze and it expanded, it's now 1.09 cubic meters. All right, um, now hopefully that makes sense. Uh, also, you don't need this for this problem, but how would you calculate X here, by the way, if they had to, if they asked you, you know, 
what's the new length or something. Well, you know the volume, right? Right here, the, the uh, shape we chose was a cube. So you know that the volume of a cube is equal to the side cubed, right? The side length cubed. So you plug in 1.09 is equal to X cubed, and you gotta take the cube root of both sides, all right? That should probably work out to be somewhere in the area of like 1.03-ish, all right? Just in case you needed it, but you don't for this problem. All right, let's erase. So, all right. Now, that being the case, I found the new volume. Now, why is that important? Well, keep in mind that we had to calculate the pressure. So pressure, now there's a whole bunch of formulas, but let's start with the most fundamental formula, is force divided by area. So essentially, I would need to find the force or the area in order to really calculate this particular pressure, right? Um, of not allowing this ice to expand, okay? Now, in order to do so, we have to think of the nature of the question. Right, and the nature of the question is such that, and this is going back now, I think, to chapter four or five, um, it's going to be going back to concepts of bulk modulus and stuff like that. All right, so we have to think back to those formulas. Now, one formula that was very important there is the, basically the bulk modulus formula, and it's right over here on the bottom right-hand side. Right, basically saying, said, it's basically a formula that's going to... Uh, give us, or we can calculate if we wanted, the force required uh, that a certain change in volume of a certain item uh, will exhibit. So that being the case, I can take this formula and I realize that there's something special about that formula. I realize that going back to the bottom left here, that pressure is equal to force over area. And well, wait a minute, look at the bottom right now, look what's in that formula, the bulk modulus formula. F over A. So actually what I'm doing is solving for F over A, right? I can actually restate this formula. I can write it as delta V is equal to one over B times, times the pressure times the VO, because they're the same thing. Then what I can do is just take this now and solve it for pressure if I wanted, right? How would I, what would we do if we had to solve that now for pressure, right? You would bring the B on up and the VO on down. So basically now it looks like it's going to be uh, the bulk modulus, right? Multiplied then by uh, delta V. And we would then divide it by the initial velocity. Uh, <laughs> not the initial velocity. The initial volume. Okay, that's the V sub O or V naught. And that's going to be equal to then the pressure. So this is really what you're after. So what do we need? We got to figure out and we have to know the bulk modulus, right, of the uh, item we're talking about. We're talking about right? H2O. So we look that up on a table. All right. That, that's, that's not given in the problem, but you have to know it in order to solve it. So the B value here is going to be about uh, 2.2 times 10 to the 9. I remember the number, forgot the units. I can figure it out from here, but honestly, who cares? The change in volume now. Well, what did the volume, how did the volume change? And actually what I'll do here is let me just, one second, let me just clean this up a little bit. Uh, delete. Okay. So uh, how much did the volume change? Well, that's why I kind of went through this, right? The volume changed by essentially 9%. Or if I had to find the difference, it's basically final volume, which we can consider as the new volume, minus the initial volume, which is basically the old volume. Okay. So what I do is I simply just now multiply this by the change in volume, which is the 1.09 minus the 1. And then simply divide that by the original volume, or the old volume, or the initial volume, whatever you want to call it. And that was just one. So, look, I mean, that's all it is. Look, you're taking bulk modulus and multiplying it by basically not the percent change, uh, but the fractional change. Okay. Uh, pretty, I mean, should be kind of, I mean, I don't know if it's interesting, but it's, uh, it's fairly straightforward, actually. So 2.2 .2 times 10 to the 9 times n.09. And what do we get? So I guess it should be, it's all round here. So there's about 2.0 times 10 to the three, six, seven, eight. It looks like eight to me. And since we're finding pressure, what are the units of pressure, right? The units of pressure are Pascal. So there's your answer. All right. That's the amount of pressure that's required uh, to either to prevent this block of ice, or excuse me, prevent this uh, block of water 
from expanding to this new volume. All right. Um, okay, so then part B, it says, what are the uh, implications of this result for biological cells that are frozen? Uh, I mean, well, if the biological cell is not able to expand at all, okay, that means then that the cell must overcome this amount of pressure. And that's a lot of pressure, all right, per unit area. Uh, will it be able to do that? Most likely not, okay? That, like I said, is a considerable amount of pressure. Um, if we think about, though, the volume chain, now, you know cells are not rigid, okay? So if you really want to delve into the biology here, you know cells are fluid, right? you got the fluid mosaic model. You know that they basically expand slightly and contract slightly based upon the volume of the environment, though we like to have a relatively constant homeostasis there. If you're thinking about then the percent change, right, from the old volume here to the new volume, we're talking about a 9% change. Now, can the cell withstand a 9% change um, in volume? Well, it might be able to. I mean, you have to think then that if the volume has expanded, we need more things, right, in the particular membrane of that cell. By things, I mean more phospholipids and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, because otherwise, right, I mean, this this is longer uh, than this. So knowing that the membrane of a cell is comprised, my, you know, uh, mostly of phospholipids, we would need to add somehow more phospholipids. Would we have to add 9% more phospholipids? Well, actually, no, because the surface area to volume ratio is, um, as you change, the percent change in volume is not proportional to the percent change in surface area. And we can get into that discussion if you wanted. Um, but I don't know if you, you know, um, I don't know if you want to, but if you do, you know, leave a comment below and let me know your thoughts about what, how would the surface area to volume ratio change? All right. Um, yeah, guys, thanks for tuning in. All right. Appreciate it very much. Hopefully this video helps and give us a hand. All right. Subscribe, please. I'm begging you. <laughs> Subscribe if you can. If you can't, eh, I love you anyway. Take care.